Okay. Okay, so um, I would like to welcome you all at our Wednesday seminar at the Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology at the University um, of Warsaw. Uh, this is our last seminar in the semester. So thank you all for coming. I guess everybody is busy with their final exams and things like that. Um, and oh, I see people people uh, coming, but still I think we should better uh, start. So, okay, I let me introduce uh, Professor Markus Virgil Virgil Fajana. Uh, he is a very acknowledged scholar, especially among social scientists involved in African studies. Um, he's a lecturer at the Institute for Social Anthropology at the University of Leipzig. His current project deals with um, forensic anthropology in cultural context in Somaliland and Peru. Um, and I guess we'll hear about uh, this project a little bit, a little bit today. Um, in his PhD, defended at Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg, he has dealt with identity and conflict in Northern Somalia. And he has also engaged in numerous projects such as um, Diasporas of Peace, Transitional Justice and Protraced Conflict. He's published extensively on um, Somali politics, history and culture, including his monograph um, entitled Between Somaliland and Puntland, Marginalization, Militarization and Conflicted Political Visions, published in London in 2000, um, 2015. Um, so welcome, 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 Marcus, um, to our seminar. And the floor, uh, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I think you should still allow me to share the screen. Is it possible that I need to? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ivona and Magdalena, for having me, for inviting me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, so I want to present um, from my current, currently ongoing, about my currently ongoing research. Um, it's, um, let's say, comparing two different contexts in which um, you know, violence has played a great role in the past, you know, in the distance past, if you like. So we're talking about something like 35 years ago, when in both settings, um, civil war was um, dominating the areas. Um, and lots of people actually disappeared or were killed, were either buried in mass graves or just were laid, you know, laid around somewhere and you know, just the, the corpses, uh, the, the bodies basically dissolved. So, I mean, there was lots of um, deaths and there was lots of disappearances in both settings. Um, and um, currently there are attempts to, so to say, localize um, the disappeared and to deal with this um, aftermath of the past violence. So actually I want to, to, to provide a comparative study um, on these two different settings in Northern Somalia and in the highlands of Peru. And I will explain in this talk, so to say, what is the connecting, um, you know, what is the red thread, so to say, what goes through um, my research and why I think both things can be compared. Um, so basically the talk is called Localizing Disappearances, Dealing with the Aftermath of Atrocities in the Highlands of Peru, Northern Somalia. And I will also then specify what I mean about localizing. So, um, let me start by saying from a methodological point of view, this is a multi-sided ethnography. After I did a long time of stationary research, if you like, in an area of like vast area of Northern Somalia, but still it was not conceptualized as multi-sided, but as multi-locale, if you like. Multi-locale research in Northern Somalia, what is today as Somaliland, um, until let's say 2015. Um, in the last five years, I conducted a multi-sided ethnography and I will explain, so to say, um, how and why I did it. So it started in um, in northwestern Somalia, which you see on this map in Somaliland, 
um, which is, um, you know, you know, largely a dry land. It's um, largely a high plateau of around 1,000 meters above sea level. Um, it is uh, semi-arid. It's inhabited by uh, pastoral nomadic people mostly. I mean, except of course in this uh, booming towns like Hargeisa, which you see on the map, the capital of Somaliland, but also the port city of Berbera, which is also a, an expanding, growing city. And in the center of Somaliland, you see a place called Buro. Um, which is the second largest town of Somaliland. So these are the huge urban centers with all together roughly probably, you know, maybe hosting almost 50% of the local population. I would say probably 1.5, almost 2 million people, let's say 1.5 million people would live in these three towns. And the rest of the 3 million inhabitants of Somaliland, so basically the other half, um, would be scattered through the countryside. And if you look at Somaliland, I mean, um, it, would probably have, you know, it would be like one third of the size of Germany, something like that. Um, so probably like um, 80,000 square kilometers. Um, um, so you have a vast area, very little infrastructure and um, very little natural resources. So most people live actually from animal husbandry or import exports through the port of Berbera um, and then up to Ethiopia, which you see here, like Eastern Ethiopia, which is a major trading partner of Somaliland. And the interesting thing is today, I mean, politically speaking, Somaliland is a, is a non-recognized state. It's a de facto state. It declared its independence from the rest of Somalia, which you see when you look at the, the, the right side of the map on Puntland and further south. Um, it um, declared its independence from the rest of Somalia in 1991, following a long civil war. Um, so the civil war started um, in 1981. In this time, and that time, Somalia was ruled by um, a dictator called Mohamed Ziad Bare. He had come to power in 1969 in a coup d'état. Um, in the first couple of years, his revolutionary government, consisting of military and police officers, was um, welcomed by the majority of the Somali population. Um, it introduced a couple of socioeconomic reforms, um, reforms of family law, um, supported women's rights, um, introduced a quite strong educational system, including the Somali script. Until 1972, Somali had not been written. It was just purely orally transmitted as a language. And uh, in 72, the government decided that the Latin script would be used in order to write Somali. And in 73, a huge literacy campaign started, which sent the students, secondary school graduates um, to the countrysides to teach the nomads reading and writing. And it was um, considered to be one of the most successful literary campaigns, literacy campaigns uh, in Africa. Um, though this, these were the, the good days, uh, so to say, of um, the Somali post-colonial state. Um, it descended uh, into uh, increasing violence, oppression, and uh, ex uh, eventually collapse um, from 1979 onwards. This um, was after um, Somalia lost the Ogaden War against Ethiopia. There was a long-standing enmity between Somalia and Ethiopia um, in post-colonial times because a huge part of Eastern Ethiopia is actually inhabited by ethnic Somalis. And the post-colonial governments in Mogadishu always claimed that these um, quite vast areas of Eastern Ethiopia should actually be ruled um, under by the Somali governments, which meant there was um, you know, a clash between those two nation states um, already from 1963 onwards. Um, and it um, peaked in this uh, formal, um, fully fledged um, conventional fighting between the Somali army and the Ethiopian army in 1978. The war was lost by Somalia and um, Somali troops retreated to, you know, to Somalia proper, if you like, after they already had occupied huge parts of Eastern Ethiopia for, from, for some time. And, and with this defeat, actually, the dictator Mohamed Ziad Barre lost the grip or control over the military. Um, and um, he started to crack down. He became very suspicious. He cracked down on anything which looked like opposition. He executed a number of military officers. Um, and um, in, in, in consequence, more and more resistance built up in Somalia, particularly among military personnel, among intellectuals, who then formed the first guerrilla groups um, in 1979, 1981. 
Um, and these guerrilla groups were hosted by Somali's arch enemy, Ethiopia. Um, so they built up bases um, in Eastern Ethiopia and started hit and run attacks against Somali forces and Somali government institutions um, from 1980, 81 onwards. And I mean, for those of you familiar with, you know, the Horn of Africa, um, you would know that Somali society is considered a segmentary lineage society. So the, you know, Somali population is divided in various, if you like, clan families, clans, subclans, lineages, and so on and so forth along the father's line or in patrilineal order. Um, and, um, you know, despite the fact that the post-colonial um, democratic and then also military governments um, strived to do away with what they called tribalism. In the Somali context, it should be called clanism. Um, this, um, you know, this clan undercurrent never really disappeared. So um, when the military government became weak and the first guerrilla groups formed in 1980-81, um, they organized along patrilineal um, belonging or lines of patrilineal belonging. Well, basically the guerrillas were strongly based on clan solidarity, which also meant that the Somali military government could localize the relatives of those guerrillas pretty easily. So, I mean, the guerrillas were literally speaking just maybe like 50, 100, 150 armed guys uh, at the beginning. But um, of course, their paternal relatives who still lived as civilians, as traders, as pastoral nomads, or as clerks or whatever in, in Somalia, they could be localized. Um, and they were punished, so to say, as a revenge punishment by the government. So the government cracked down on the civilian population, particularly in northern Somalia, where um, most relatives of those guerrillas um, lived. And, um, you know, throughout the 1980s, the milita military government of Somalia actually committed increasing atrocities. I mean, initially it arrested sus suspects, it arrested the close relatives of, of known guerrillas. But, you know, like in 84, 85, it actually started to simply summary execute um, village populations and, um, you know, capture nomadic people on, on the way and execute them and just, you know, let the corpse lay in the countryside or just bury them quickly in some holes and stuff. So actually the, the, the repression increased, the terror increased. And this is depicted on this monument, which is the pedestal of, so to say, the freedom monument in Hargeisa, which is today the capital of Somaliland. Um, I photographed it in 2003 and I was really impressed by you know, this depiction because it's really horrific what you can see at the same time it's in this kind of Disney-esque style, it's very colorful and this monument is located in the middle of one of the most busiest squares of the capital city of Somaliland today. Around it you have tea shops, you have people meeting, you know, um, you know, couples start dates dating around this monument. So it's a very busy and very lively spot. But actually the history it refers to is um, quite horrific. Um, the civil war ended in 1991 with the victory of the guerrillas, you know, the military government of Somalia lost its external support in the context of the Cold War. It had been once allied with the USSR, then later on from 1980 onwards it was allied with the United States. But um, towards the end of the 80s, um, in uh, 1988, 89, um, Somalia lost the support of the government in Washington. Eventually, the guerrillas became um, stronger and stronger. And in 1991, um, the dictator Mohamed Ziad Barre and his last remaining um, allies, the followers, were um, um, driven out of the capital city of Mogadishu. And in northern Somalia, where Somaliland is located, um, the Somali army was defeated and disappeared. Basically, um, people, I mean, soldiers disappeared to the clan, clan homelands, if you like. This one was um, basically the beginning of a new political process, which led to the rebuilding of the area and declaration of independence in 1991, in May 1991. So it's now just 30 years that Somaliland declared itself independent. It still is not recognized um, as a state, but it's in political science, it's called a de facto state. So it basically exhibits all features of statehood according to international law, if you like. Though so it has a clearly demarcated territory because Somaliland actually was a former British protectorate in colonial time, whereas the rest of Somalia was under Italian administration. And those two administrations united in 1960 to form the Republic of Somalia. So basically Somaliland reclaimed its colonial borders 
not unlike Eritrea, for instance, did also in, in 1993, uh, I think. Um, so it reclaimed its uh, colonial borders, declared itself independent, built up uh, uh, its own government, it introduced a new, its own currency. Um, the population consists of members of different patrilineal descent groups, but the majority of the local population supports the government of Somaliland, so there is some opposition in some corners of the country. However, um, if you say, like, you can easily say, like, more than 60, 70 percent of the local population actually supports the independence of, um, of Somaliland and the ports, uh, support the government. Um, a democratic political process has been introduced in the in the 2000s from 2002 onwards and just recently actually on 31st of May 2021 um, par um, parliamentary elections have been held in Somaliland and this was just you know the most recent election in a series of elections which have been held in the country since 2002 so there have been several presidential elections several changes of power um, peaceful changes of power so I mean overall if you look in the news Today, you would find that Somaliland is praised as a bacon of peace, as an island of peace and stability in the Horn of Africa, surrounded by states like Eritrea, also Ethiopia, Kenya, and of course, the rest of Somalia, which are often not featuring very positively in the news. So they are often considered to be, um, you know, um, the homes of corruption, of, you know, civil war violations, of uh, civil rights violations, of human rights violations, and so on. Um, and of authoritarian governments. So Somaliland, in a way, is, uh, is an example of a very successful, peaceful political um, entity. However, it lacks international recognition. So this image I provided you here is just a, a snapshot from, you know, from my balcony in, when I was in the government in, in the capital in 2015. Um, how things have developed, how it looks like. So it looks pretty, pretty much like an Eastern Eastern African um, capital city, I would say today. So. Um, so much about Somaliland. The interesting thing is, I mean, that's where I started. The interesting thing is um, in 2012, I, um, I heard, or actually I heard a bit later, but uh, I heard it same, something in 2013, I think, but actually in 2012, something new started. So while most of the discussions in Somaliland were about the question of international recognition and democratization and why it all doesn't bring international recognition, there was actually very little discourse about memory. So and in 2012, a new phenomenon started, which was um, a Peruvian team of forensic anthropologists um, starting exhuming mass graves from the time of the dictatorship in the 1980s um, in the area, I mean, around Hargeisa, the capital of Somaliland, and some other places, including Berbera, the port town of Somaliland. So when I heard about it, I really became quite um, interested because I thought this is something I never would have expected. You know, the discourse about the past in Somaliland was very much, you know, let's not talk about it. So we overcame the problems. We all have seen major trouble, you know, different members of different um, patrilineal descent groups have been fighting, have fought on different sides um, during this, uh, the 1980s, during the period of the civil war. There was, of course, a major guerrilla movement, which then eventually toppled the, the army and established Somaliland. But there have been smaller groups in parts of Somaliland which actually supported the military dictatorship until 1991. So there have been tensions in, among the people of Somaliland. So, and the solution wa was until, um, you know, for the first 20 years of Somaliland, the solution basically was let's not talk about it. So, when this forensic anthropologist from Peru came to the country in 2012 and started opening mass graves, I, I sensed that this would be a major, um, major change, so to say, in the in the political field, or it could provoke a major change in the political field. And I became quite interested, and I thought I have to. I have to look into that, and this is, was the beginning, actually, of my multi-sided ethnography. So um, I applied for, you know, these Peruans. Actually, they they announced field schools. So they said this is just an announcement from a field school. So they called it "Uncovering Somaliland's Travel Past." They advertised it globally, if you like, um, and um, they attracted mostly students from North America and Europe who were studying ISA archaeology, bioarchaeology, um, uh, who wanted to specialize in legal medicine or who wanted to specialize even in forensic anthropology. However, as you may know, forensic anthropology is a very new um, craft. Um, at least it's, it's a new craft if you think about it as, um, as an institutionalized um, discipline. Of course, forensic anthropology has been practiced already a while ago. 
but um, it, its institutionalization is, um, is only recent and only in a few places in the UK and North America, you can actually study a BA or MA in forensic anthropology. Otherwise, you first would have to become an archaeologist or you would study um, genetics and biology and um, combine it with medicine or something like that. And then you would eventually arrive at forensic anthropology, usually as a postgraduate. So anyway, so this field school was designed by the Peru and forensic anthropologists in order to attract the few students worldwide who have a very serious interest in this quite rare craft and who would pay a sizable amount of money actually to participate um, in the field schools. So they, um, the team, which you can see in the middle, you see the guy with a white t-shirt. That is, this is uh, Jose Pablo Baraiba. He has his uh, glasses on. You see him in the middle of the, of the poster. So he's actually a world famous forensic anthropologist from Lima. Um, who, um, who has a very distinguished career. Um, he served, you know, uh, he worked in Rwanda, he worked in uh, exhuming uh, mass graves in Srebrenica in former Yugoslavia. He worked for the UN in Srebrenica. Um, and then um, he was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Peru. He worked for the government in Peru for a short period of time when actually the, the aftermath of the violence in Peru was, um, you know, discussed and um, um, taken care of from 2002 onwards. Um, and currently, actually, he works for the International Red Cross and is localizing um, dead bodies in the Mediterranean and trying to trace them back to their homes in North Africa or West Africa. Uh, so he has a very senior position. Um, he had a senior, he had sen a senior position since many years, actually. So, and he and a few assistants of him were the center of this forensic field schools. And uh, they would invite up to 20 students um, to participate with them in these exhumations, as you can see on these pictures, um, and learn to say by doing what forensic anthropology is. And the attraction was, I mean, I say it a little bit cynically, but to do it in a real, I mean, in a real life setting. I mean, normally forensic anthropologists in North America, they would, um, they would have laboratory, um, they would have, you know, artificial conditions, you know, they would have some, some fields in which um, pig cadavers would have been buried and then they would exhume those pig cadavers. So there are even body farms now in Australia where you can donate a body, then it's kind of reburied there and for anthropologists can train how to exhume and deal with you know the remains so but this is quite um, quite rare so actually you know doing the real stuff being in a real former civil war setting you know exhuming um, real mass graves um, in a context like Somaliland that was to be honest it was quite thrilling for a few students so I talked with many because I aligned I, I signed up for these field schools so I got a little budget I signed up for a field school and um, told, of course, Jose Pablo Baraiba and others that I would not um, be interested in becoming a forensic anthropologist, that I, but that I'm a sociocultural anthropologist who wants to observe what they are doing. And of course, also, that's my actually my real interest, how this particular intervention in the local political context um, is perceived by ordinary people in, in the area. So anyway, so I participated in those field schools in 2016 and 2017, two times doing everything forensic anthropologists have to do. Um, and then this is then the second part of my forensic, uh, my multi-sided ethnography. Then basically I, I followed this whole process up in Peru because that's where the forensics came from. Uh, and then I became interested how actually it all started and how um, you know, Jose pa Pablo Baraiva and others, how they actually um, came up with the idea to become forensic anthropologists. Uh, how the political context in Peru was uh, also in the 1980s, 1990s, and then early 2000s um, for forensic anthropologists and how the work they did in, in the recent years was perceived by the local population there. So I, I ended up in Peru for the first time in 2016, where I again attended a field school by, um, by this um, forensic anthropologist around Jose Pablo Baraiba. However, this field school was not um, direct exhumations as in Somaliland, but it was more like a field school on transitional justice because most of the exhumations in Peru have already happened um, between 2002 and I would say 2015. So there are a few exhumations still ongoing, but quite rarely. So most um, the intense time of, of exhuming um, the violent past in Peru um, was um, between 2002 and 2015, I would say. 
in the area in which most exhumations happened was um, the region of Ayacucho in the Peruan Andi, Andinian area in the Andes. So it's between 2,700 and 4,500 meters above um, sea level. And on the map here in the, on the slide, you see um, the region of Ayacucho, uh, the Ayacucho region in which um, most of these exhumations happened, because this was actually the, um, the center of, um, of violence, if you like, in, um, in the time um, of the, the, the civil war, basically, between the Peruvian government and Sendero Luminoso. Sendero Luminoso, I guess some of you may have heard about it, or the Shining Pass. This was, um, this was uh, Maoist movement um, led um, by Guzman, a former philosophy professor who, who taught actually in the highlands in a newly established university um, in Ayacucho city or Huamanga as it's also called. So he was uh, teaching in the area in the 19, late 1960s and in the 1970s. Um, and um, then decided actually that teaching alone is not enough. He was inspired by Mao. He I think also visited China a few times and that around the time of the Cultural Revolution. Um, so he took inspiration from the action um, in China and um, implemented it in Peru. He started a, a movement uh, in 1980 exactly. Um, Ironically, at the time when there was uh, the first elections after a period of military governments, there was a first election happening. Um, so there was a transition from authoritarian rule or you know, authoritarian rule to democracy. And this transition actually had been introduced by one of these, the last uh, authoritarian governments itself. So it was not a revolution which led to democracy in Peru in 1980, but it was actually um, the decree of the ruling authoritarian government that there should be an end to this kind of rule. But at this moment, um, Guzman and his followers interfered uh, and attacked the polling stations in the highlands in Ayacucho region, um, and robbed you know, the polling station, attacked police stations. Initially, it was a peasant movement, so they basically you know, um, had machetes and other um, peasant um, equipment in order to um, attack. They robbed um, arms quickly, and then it became, for the next 10 to 15 years, it became a very scary and very successful um, armed movement, in the, particularly in the highlands of Peru. So Sendero Luminoso um, is, uh, was at, you know, probably around 85 to 90, and then also, yeah, 85 to 90, basically, it was controlling huge parts of um, the Peruan highlands. Um, the military did not, um, the Peruan government and, and the Peruan national forces did not really know how to deal with these rebels in the mountains initially. So um, the government, I think in 1982, sent um, the army to the area, put the area under military rule, the Ayacucho region under military rule. But um, you could imagine these, the young soldiers, basically 20 year old guys, they came from the lowlands. So they came from the, mostly from, from the, from the areas close to the to the um, um, ocean, and so they were absolutely overwhelmed when they were had to go up to 2,700, 4,500 meters. They physically couldn't manage, um, and they also were mostly, so to say, Spanish of Spanish origin, whereas the um, highland inhabitants were mostly of um, Inca origin, so were mostly indigenous people, if you like. So they had language difference. There were lots of racist stereotypes um, against the local population by the young soldiers. The young soldiers didn't manage. Um, the physical challenges initially um, to, to move and to operate at the, this great height. Um, and of course, the local guerrillas had the um, advantage of your, knowing the geographic terrain. So basically, it was a quite um, difficult war. The army had to fight against um, the Sendero Luminoso in the highlands. Um, and basically, it turned um, out that the government simply similar, like in northern Somalia, actually started cracking down against the local um, civilian population, which was su suspected to support Sendero Luminoso. And Sendero Luminoso, as you can see on this retablo, which is basically a memory altar, if you like, Sendero Luminoso was actually attacking villages which were suspected of supporting the government. Then they were running away and disappearing into the mountains. 
Um, then a few days later, probably the government forces would arrive at this village and instead of helping the local population, they again started killing those people who were suspected of having supported Sendero Luminoso initially. So if you go through the area, you would find many villages which have been attacked both by the government forces and by the guerrillas. And actually very little direct confrontations happened between Sendero Luminoso and the armed forces. And very often actually the civilian populations which were in between were attacked. And the, you know, the violence was quite um, outrageous, quite horrific as, as you can see on these depictions. Then so, all this happened in the 1980s, again in an area which was is inhabited mostly by, um, by subsistence farmers, um, in contrast to Northern Somalia, people in the highlands of Ayacucho um, would be mostly farmers, they would have a couple of yamas and other animals, but mostly they would um, grow maize and potatoes and other vegetables and other, other grain. So, um, but they were marginalized people in the 1980s, similar to, to the situation in the 1980s in Northern Somalia, where people were also quite marginalized, I mean, economically and so on and so forth, people in Northern Somalia were equally marginalized. And I would also say there's a parallel in the type of violence. It was mostly you know, an overpowering force in Northern Somalia, it would be the government forces, and in Peru, it would be the government forces, or Sendero Luminoso, who were actually violating the local civilians who could you know, hardly resist against, against these um, attacks. Um, so the, the last part of my uh, multi-sided ethnography um, brought me to, um, to the United States in 2016, in fall, to the, in end of 2016, I, I went to San Francisco in order to spend one week with the Center for Justice and Accountability. And the reason was, so to say, in my multi-sided ethnography that this was where, um, you know, where actually this whole operation to bring f Peruan forensic anthropologists to Northern Somalia had started. Because the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco is basically um, specialized um, to bring, you know, foreign nationals who have a permanent residence in the United States to justice in case they were suspected of human rights violations. So if there were some, you know, some former like memberships of some military dictatorships somewhere, if they would take a residence in the United States as refugees normally, um, they and they would be identified, they could be persecuted, um, and Center for Justice and Accountability is specializing on exactly this process. And in 2000, by chance, you know, some Somali refugees from Northern Somalia who had experienced the violence of the military dictatorship in the 1980s, they met um, one of the main actors who was responsible for this violence, namely the former Minister of Defense of Somalia, um, General Mohammed Ali Samata. So he also had taken refuge in North America after 1991 because Somalia, as you know, collapsed. So this first civil war in the North was just the first round of fighting. And then you know, after Somaliland had been established in the North, Southern Somalia actually um, completely descended into an ongoing, into a still ongoing um, phase of civil war. So between 1991 and to today, in South and Somalia, particularly the government of uh, the capital city of Mogadishu, is pretty much a violent place. And the former Minister of Defense, General Mohammed Ali Samata, um, escaped himself in 1991, first to Italy, then um, and then to to North America, to the United States, and he took residence in Virginia. He sent his children to school, and you know it, it was an incredible in a coincidence. But you know the children of the general and the children of those people who have been violated by the Somali army met in school. And they sat next to each other and eventually the kids came home and told their parents, you know, I'm sitting next to the daughter or the son of General Mohammed Ali Samata. And then the father or the mother of the child said, you know, that's impossible. And they started investigating. They found the assistance of the Center for Justice and Accountability. And eventually they started civil proceedings against former uh, Minister of Defense of Somalia in 2001. And the case dragged on for more than a decade, but I think in 2012, it eventually was concluded with a sentence. And the, 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 the general was, was found um, liable for you know, massive human rights violations, but in a civil context, which meant he was um, sentenced to a huge sum of um, compensation, I think 12 million US dollar or 20 million US dollar. However, he shortly afterwards died. So he, uh, I think he filed for bankruptcy and like one or two years later, he died. But the interesting thing is the Center for Justice and Accountability was involved in this case. 
They knew about, they investigated in the human rights violations in Northern Somalia, today Somaliland. Um, and at the same time, they had good contacts to Jose Pablo Baraiba, um, the Peruan specialist. And at a, you know, at a dinner where he was supposed to receive an award from Center for Justice and Accountability for his engagement for human rights in 2010, Jose Pablo Baraiba and some quite influential, influential human rights activists from, from Somaliland met in San Francisco at this dinner. And this must have been the moment when actually the idea was transmitted to Jose Pablo that he could start investigations in Somaliland. So for me as an anthropologist, it was absolutely fascinating to see how, you know, how these things actually must have come together at a very personal level involving as usual, lots of coincidences. So Jose Pablo Baraiba is invited to a gala dinner in, in San Francisco. One of the Somali human rights activists who has been working already for 10 years with Center for Justice and Accountability is also invited. They have a nice chat over dinner, and eventually um, the decision is taken that um, the Peruvian forensic anthropologists should start investigating um, the, um, the mass graves um, from the 1980s in northern Somalia. So that's where it all came together, and that's where actually my multi-sided ethnography started from the very beginning. So that's how I, I connect all these three spots, northern Somalia, the highlands in Peru, um, and, um, and, and California, if you like. So um, my central research question for the whole project, which I'm not discussing here in detail, um, are how these different um, how these different cultural contexts influence actually the work of forensic anthropologists. Um, how actually also um, spiritual concepts, loyal views about the life after death, um, influence again the work of forensic anthropologists. Um, how also global discourses about justice influence what's going on. You know, with forensic anthropology in places like Somaliland, Peru, and other places, and what um, economic and political interests are related to these operations. So these are my larger questions. Um, but for this talk, I wanted to talk more about localizing, the question of localizing. Though I think localizing can be thought of in, in a geographical sense, more like what archaeologists would, for instance, do, localizing a certain place which needs to be exhumed, can be also thought about in a more so sociocultural sense, more like um, cultural embeddings or how a certain operation or how a certain idea is embedded in a local context. So the idea would be, of course, the idea of forensic anthropology and everything related to it. And I just found another interesting, um, you know, as um, understanding of localizing in the sense that it would be um, related to the process of adapting a product to a specific target market in global economy. So you have tendency to internationalize um, global, um, to, to internationalize um, um, economic production, but then the product still needs to be localized in order to be successful, let's say, in the United States versus Europe. So these um, aspects, particularly the first two, I find um, important for my talk. So if you, if I can now guide you quickly through, um, through the geographical aspects of um, forensic anthropology, I would start with the quite physical um, aspects of it. So if you start exhuming a mass grave, so first of all, you, it's it's really all about the consistency of the soil. You know the the, the geographic conditions and consistency of the soil. Um, where is the place? Is it near to a town? Is it inside a town? Is it inside a neighborhood where people live? Um, has it been flooded? Is the soil extremely hard? And so on and so forth. You can see that um, physical. So forensic anthropology is a very physical and yeah, very physical task actually, similar to archaeology, um, but um, and everything has to be documented in order to make it um, later on applicable uh, as a, or acceptable as a proof in court, because that's, of course, the final aim to document human rights violations um, through forensic anthropology and then eventually um, provide this as evidence in court proceedings. Um, so, but um, I found, I was really astonished how on the one hand, quite, you know, small tools were used in order to um, remove, let's say, dust or earth and stuff. And at the same time, when, you know, um, when we have been already exhuming, exhuming for days in the heat and we didn't find any human remains, they called in, you know, huge, heavy equipment in order to remove, let's say, two meters of earth at once. Um, so, and then again, once it was removed, then we had to do the physical job, we had to do the handwork and started shoveling um, the earth and um, the forensic anthropologist, you see the guy with the hat, it's Jose Pablo Baraiba, so he's 
you know, the famous specialist of everything. So he started to um, investigate and again, the consistency of the earth, looking for traces, you know, from the ex executions and, um, and, 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 and burial, like in 35 years ago, actually. So and eventually, so he took um, equipment himself, he followed some traces which he saw, then they found actually the original, you know, the original depth of this mass grave where actually in 1985 the, the huge equipment um, um, must have dug up the mass grave. So you can see how they start reading in a way the earth. And then eventually here you see the assistant of Jose Pablo Baraiba, Franco Mora, who eventually localizes a piece of clothes, like almost two and a half meters below the level where we started digging with hands. So, um, and this is very hard earth. So you can imagine it, it, it was a hell of a work actually to remove this earth. So we called in this heavy um, equipment in order to remove it quicker. But so the last moment again was quite sensitive um, handwork when this piece of clothing was removed and it eventually led to the uncovering of a whole mass grave, uh, which then of course was um, properly uh, first exhumed and documented. So this is one aspect of localizing um, the localizing the disappeared. And here you of course see then one of those um, poor fellows who have been um, executed in, in 1985 by um, a, a military unit of the Somali army uh, in this village. Um, then the next, the next aspect of localizing is the disposal. I mean, the collection of the bones and the disposal of those bones or the laying out of the skeleton on a desk, which is uh, on a table, which is an improvised laboratory nearby, nearby the mass grave site. Um, and then of course, reassembling the bones and um, really very carefully analyzing every fracture if it was caused by some, you know, beating or stabbing or shooting, or if it was just caused, you know, after death through by some roots which were growing through the gravesite or, you know, something else. So um, this is again, I would say part of dislocating and locating the disappeared. And then the final aspect in Northern Somalia of relocalizing um, the disappeared or the, you know, the people who have been, you know, killed and just um, shoveled into those graves. And the last aspect of relocalizing them was this reburial ceremony, which then should follow, you know, the exhumation and the analysis of the bones. So let us jump to Peru. So as I said, I couldn't, um, I couldn't really participate in exhumations in Peru because they happened before my arrival there. But this is just an area, it's called Putis. It's um, in the highlands, um, quite high up, I would say 4,200 meters likely. And there in the middle of the picture where you see a couple of houses, this where, was where the old village was and where also a horrific um, atrocity actually by the national army, by the Peruvian army happened. Um, um, I would say around 1985. So you can see this in this mural where in the background you have soldiers shooting, I think almost, I would have to lie, I would have to go back to my notes, but several dozen civilians actually. I would say up to 90, up to 90, almost 100 people, men, women, and children have been shot in this place. And then you see in the middle, actually in the foreground, you see um, the exhumations um, happening there probably around 2008. And you see the guy with, you know, the long hair and with the little um, pigtail, this is Franco Mora. This is the guy, the assistant of Jose Pablo Baraiba, the guy with a white shirt. Um, who uh, also assisted exhuming in Northern Somalia in 2016-17. And so this was around 2008 um, when he started as a very young forensic anthropologist under the guidance of Jose Pablo Baraiba. So he's depicted on this mural. So you can see the process in this context and you can see the participation of the local population, which is mostly depicted in indigenous dresses. So like referring to, you know, referring to the reality of the place where mostly indigenous people actually live or descendants of Inca live actually. Um, right, so this is then today the site where, where this you know, huge amount of bodies was actually found. It's, it's difficult to imagine that almost 100 bodies would fit there, but they must have been lay, laying on each other for a long while and um, before they were exhumed. So this is a little memorial site. Um, this is then the next step, again, similar like in Somaliland, um, when bodies have been exhumed, analyzed, and ideally identified, then um, this is a reburial ceremony in the cathedral of um, Ayacucho city, the capital city of the region, also called Huamanga. Um, 
This happened in 2019 when I was the second time in Peru, um, where lots of you know speeches by political um, functionaries were given before these bodies were handed over to their relatives and reburied individually. So this is all I would say. This has something to do with you know geographical localization. Um, so I think in this regard, the situation in Somaliland and in Peru was pretty similar. There were similar aspects to the whole work and also to um, to the proceedings. Um, so now about the social cultural aspects of the whole work. So the interesting thing is that in Somaliland there was a substantial resistance against uh, the exhumations. So, and the, the, the quite weird thing which I had to figure out first was that actually in Somaliland, the government um, was supporting the Peruvian ex um, forensic anthropologists to do their work. So the, the Peruvian team, including the students who were participating in the field school, they had um, the government provided um, guards, the government provided transportation and the government paid for the overnight of the whole team for like five weeks, the duration of the field school. Um, so the government invested actually in the whole project because the Peruvian forensic anthropologists, I mean, they are a small NGO, they do not have large funding, they depend actually on external funding to do their work. So in Somaliland, the government basically supported this um, endeavors and provided, you know, several thousands of dollars per, seasons, per season in order to support um, the forensic anthropological work. However, the local population and particularly the relatives of those people to be exhumed, they resisted. Um, so you see in the middle of the picture, you see a religious leader who is a close relative um, of one of those persons who has been laying in one of these mass graves. I mean, I've just showed you the exhumation process. Um, actually, this mass grave, which, which was exhumed, um, um, uh, in, in, included one of his, I think, brothers who was killed in 85. So when he came um, to know that these exhumations were ongoing, he rushed to the site. It was a little bit outside of the capital city. So he came from the capital um, in his own car together with a couple of other relatives. The guy with the hat in the background is also a close relative. So they came and tried to prevent the Peruan forensic anthropological team from exhuming their relatives. And this was quite contrary actually to the discourse which the forensic anthropologists themselves produced. They would say, we are here to help, you know, to reunite the living with the dead. It's a humanitarian project. We want to um, support justice. So they were not doing it for the government in their own terms. Actually, they were doing it in their own perception for the local population. But the strange thing was, here we have a close relative of one of those people in the Musgraves who says, no, don't do it. Please don't do it. And the interesting thing even was, he was a religious leader, so he was an educated sheikh, who said, according to Islam, according to his interpretation of Islam, at least, um, it's actually uh, forbidden to open those graves and foreigners shouldn't do that by sh for sure. Um, and they shouldn't handle those bones and so on and so forth. They shouldn't interfere with those graves. Um, so it was a long, it created a really serious complication. The, inter the national media came as you can see. Um, and then eventually even the minister of justice appeared um, and tried to convince him and other relatives that this was in the interest of the country and that these exhumations would happen. Um, so then eventually he, he settled um, to, um, to say, okay, you can do it only in, but only under the condition that you eventually will bring the military officer who was responsible for this massacre in 1985 to justice in Somaliland. So you have to bring the guy, he's actually known, he is a colonel, he also lives in the United States today. Um, so you have to bring this guy to Somaliland and you have to put him on trial. Then we accept this, um, this exhumation. Um, and of course, um, the Minister of Justice said, we will do our best to manage what you want. And then the exhumations proceeded. And of course, you cannot expect that, you know, Somaliland is a non-recognized country, so nobody will be... Um, um, deported from the United States to Somaliland in order to put him in front of a court there. So actually it's not going to happen. So, but for me as an anthropologist, the interesting thing was how this, this resistance was justified and it was justified mostly in religious terms. And secondly, also in social terms, if you like, I mean, the, the normal way um, of Somalis to deal with killings is, you know, compensation. So I kill, you know, 
intentionally or not intentionally, some other Somali guy, then his relatives will come and say, you have to pay 100 camels for what you did. So I will talk to my family. They, everyone provides a couple of camels or the equivalent in US dollars. So we would pay this compensation in order to prevent further conflict. If I'm not paying compensation, I will have to expect a revenge killing. You know, I myself or some of my relatives, close patrilineal relatives will be killed by the um, relatives of the person I killed. So normally it's either revenge killing or it's compensation. In this particular case, the military, the, the Somali military killed the social, the, the local population eight, 35 years ago. It's clear that, you know, who shall pay compensation? You know, the soldier probably isn't alive anymore. We also wouldn't know who exactly killed, um, killed, um, killed which person, person. There's no way of getting any compensation. And, um, you know, to... Um, to hold proceedings in, you know, in this context of uh, human rights, um, you know, bringing, uh, you know, justice to uh, people whose human rights have been violated. This is actually not a discourse which is very well established in Somaliland. This demand by the sheikh that the colonel who was responsible for the executions should be brought to justice in Somaliland, this was in a way you know, this was in a way almost an exceptional demand. I mean, many people actually wanted either compensation or they wanted that those people who killed their relatives would be killed. Or actually, and this was also um, quite visible in this particular situation, they said, don't disturb us, you know, do not um, open the old wounds, um, leave us in peace, what happened, happened. And uh, inshallah, all the, um, inshallah, all those people who have been killed in 85 will go to heaven, will go to paradise, um, and we move on with our lives. Again, I mean, this resistance was not um, a single, you know, single event. It happened in another exhumation the next year again. And this boy who is, or this young man who is now here handled by the, by the soldiers um, protecting the forensic team, he is the son of a guy who has been killed. So his mother was pregnant um, with this man. He's called Mohammed. So his mother was pregnant with Mohammed. With him, while when his father actually was executed, um, probably in 1987. Um, so, and he heard about um, the exhumations when they were ongoing and positioned himself at the entrance to the mass grave um, in order again to prevent the forensic team doing its, its work. And then the soldiers had to interfere and had to remove him from the site. So, again, it's, it's, it was a scene which actually should not have happened if you follow the discourse of the forensic anthropologists. Um, and then, you know, I'm jumping a little bit further. This was now um, um, at a reburial site. So actually a very joyous moment uh, from the perspective of forensic anthropologists. You know, everything has been, the work has been completed. The bodies have been more or less identified. Not everybody could be identified, but some could be identified. There is a reburial as each skeleton, each, each say body gets its own grave, not a mass grave anymore. There will be Islamic prayers held, so everything according to the local culture. But then you see these guys with the white um, sheets on their head, who are again close relatives of those people exhumed. Um, and they are very angry. So this, um, you can see from the expressions, from the gestures and the fact that they put these white sheets on. Um, this means in the local context, they are grieving and they are outraged. And they talk to Jose Pablo Baraiba, the guy in the middle with the um, sunglasses on. Um, and uh, Franco Mora actually is also next to him, the guy with the Palestinian um, scarf on his head. Um, so they say, why did you actually do the whole thing? Because you know, the reburial um, didn't, it, it could, the forensic anthropological investigation couldn't produce um, each and every individual name. You know, there were maybe 22 persons in these graves and not everyone could be identified. So this outraged them. Um, of course, it has something to do with the lack of funding for this whole project, that in not every case a DNA test could be made and so on and so forth, and DNA tests have their own complications. So it's quite normal for forensic anthropologists that you do not have a 100% identification rate. But this was actually what the locals um, expected. It was not transmitted to them that this would not be the case. And the other thing was, again, the question about compensation. So they were asking, um, so what now? I mean, do we get any um, compensation from the Somaliland government? Who pays for or, you know, the killing of my brother, my father, my uncle, and so on and so forth. Um, and you see Jose Pablo Baraiba is quite unhappy with this uh, development because it should have been a very joyous moment, you know, to bring conclusion, to reunite the living with the dead, and to, you know, 
maybe bring some you know peace of mind to the local population who had been affected by those violent events in the 1980s but quite the contrary actually it didn't bring peace of mind so now we jump to peru so this was now after the restitution ceremony, which I just um, depicted a couple of pictures earlier. Um, this was now in a private home. We were invited to participate in this um, commemoration night, the Vigil, if you like, um, for this particular person um, who had been exhumed, identified, and returned to his family. Um, and this was, of course, like a Christian ceremony, as you can see from the whole setting. Um, and then, um, Actually, he was reburied in uh, in the highlands, um, in the family, um, in the area where he originated from. And this was again a very, you know, rural area. So this is now a jump, just to talk about how much memory actually is important in the in the in the in the Peruan setting. So this is a, a, a these are pictures I took from a museum of memory in Lima where you can see how people, um, so to say, are physically close um, to those, um, you know, relatives who have been exhumed, um, how they actually treasure old photographs they have. And on the right side, you have um, a little um, handwritten um, entry in, 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 this, um, in the memory book or in this guest book of the museum. In the middle, I would read, Paz sin justicia no existe, el Peru exige justicia. So peace without justice doesn't exist and uh, Peru demands um, justice. So, um, so this is this conception of, there is a very abstract form of justice, I would say an abstract form of justice, which is indeed related to a human rights discourse. Um, it's a demand towards the government to provide um, the local population at least with this kind of you know, human rights related justice measures like tribunals, you know, like at least recognition, at least something like that. Um, and you can also see that there's this kind of rather physical closeness actually between the living and the dead, if you like. So that's how I would interpret this, this picture. And this was quite different actually in Somaliland where this, uh, this abstract idea of justice and that the government would be, um, you know, some providing this kind of justice through, or the international community would provide this justice through, you know, tribunals and so on and so forth. This was quite absent in Somaliland. I mean, mostly it was about either direct compensation or, um, you know, or actually forgetting what happened in order to move on with life. So the adaptation of the, to the local condition in this particular case, how did forensic anthropology adapt to the local condition? I would say in Peru, it was actually the, this is now the conclusion of this, um, a little bit very, you know, impressionistic talk, I guess. I mean, it's, it's pretty much field research based. Um, in Peru, forensic anthropology, I would argue, was a part of a, of a pre-existing rights discourse. So in, in, in Peru, you already have a long tradition of, so to say, um, state-driven or even internationally driven human rights um, proceedings. So, I mean, not by, by chance, um, you have uh, situations like in Argentine in the 1980s, where, um, where actually um, the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo actually demanded to know about the disappeared children. It was popularized in Latin America. Um, from there, actually, forensic anthropology developed. I mean, I don't want to bore you now with the genealogy of forensic anthropology, but it actually started in, in, in Latin America. It started in, in Argentine in the mid 1980s. And this was also where Jose Pablo Baraiba did an internship as a very young student in the late 1990s, where he actually came into close contact with forensic anthropology for the first time and participated in exhumations himself after he had been trained as an archaeologist in Lima. So actually in, in Latin America, you have a long tradition of human rights discourses, of um, civil rights movements, and of the combination between, you know, civil rights movements and, um, you know, um, institutionalized justice proceedings, if you like. And in Peru, Peru, you had a former Truth and Reconciliation Commission installed in 2001, running until 2003, which called on forensic anthropologists to integrate themselves into these proceedings and start the craft, so to say, in order to shed light on what happened in, in, in the 1980s. Um, so this whole 
all um, this, this sort of the institutionalized justice discourses and human rights um, discourses were um, present in Peru, even in the peripheral areas, even in the Ayacucho region where um, most people lived as peasants in quite far away places. Um, whereas um, in, in Somaliland, um, this discourse didn't have any ground. The strongest discourse, I would say, was about um, religious, religious normativity. It was influenced by um, the interpretation of uh, Islamic provisions um, and the questions, is, is it haram or is it halal, what these um, this forensic anthropologists are doing. And most local people decided it's haram. It shouldn't happen. And the government tried to push it through because it had its own interests regarding forensic anthropology in the area. They, of course, wanted to prove that a genocide happened, had happened in the 1980s, and this should be an argument why Somaliland should gain recognition. It should be an additional argument why the unrecognized state of Somaliland should become recognized because it was, a, you know, the population was victim of a genocide in the 1980s. That was actually the logic of the government officials in Somaliland, but the, the forensics, of course, couldn't, um, you know, couldn't prove genocide. That's not their job. You know, they simply could exhume mass grave, graves, analyze the human remains, establish certain patterns of violence. But the question, was it a genocide or not, would be um, answered normally by international tribunals. But exactly these tribunals were not in place in Somaliland, whereas actually tribunals were in place in Peru. So you could see there were quite different um, traditions and quite different forms of dealing with issues of justice and compensation in both locations. And forensic anthropology did actually not adapt very well to the situation in northern Somalia. Um, Exactly. These are a couple of small snapshots from, from the exhumations in Somalia. I wanted to show you this woman here briefly, or these two women, actually. So this woman um, with this headscarf and the little child next to her, she's called Halima. And, um, you know, she was a resident next to one of these exhumation sites. She's a pretty poor woman. She's a grandmother already. She must be around 30, uh, no, 40. Um, she has already grandchildren. I this child is one of, it's her second grandchild, I think. Um, and she called on me when, you know, when I was just walking around in the area, she saw that I would speak Somali. So she called me and said, what, what are you doing? And then I explained it to her in my own words and relatively broken Somali, what we are doing. And then eventually she said this beautiful sentence in my eyes, she said, those people who always remember are, are, are dwellers of hell. Those people who always remember are dwellers of hell. Which in a way summarized the local perception of forensic anthropology and exhumations and everything. So basically, you know, past is past and, and, and do not remember um, because memories only bring back pain and you cannot change anything about your miserable conditions in the present. I mean, people are poor, people are still struggling to survive, but forensic anthropology doesn't change anything about that. And in their perception, you know, that's what she also said, in their perception, those people who have been killed in the 1980s by the military dictatorship of Somalia, they went straight to paradise. So don't worry about it. Justice is in the hereafter. And in the present world, there is no justice. And though so we shouldn't actually look for that. Um, whereas in Peru, the discourse was quite different. You know, this woman who you can sit there sitting next to some seats. I mean, her sister has been killed and I think also her father has been killed. So she experienced really horrific violence when she was a younger woman. Um, they are still waiting. The women and, and, you know, the relatives of those people violated in the highlands of, in, of, of, of Peru, of, in the Ayacucho region, they are still waiting for justice. And I would say they are not at peace at all, in contrast to the situation in northern Somalia, where most people actually made their peace with the violent past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus, for this uh, insightful, interesting lecture. Uh